So now let's go ahead and go to the software. We're going to use my numbers to show what it would look like to, you know, pay this thing off doing velocity banking essentially. Because what's great about this product is there, there's nothing additional that I have to do with the velocity banking concept. It, it's already there. I already have the debt tool. I can set up all my income to go in and out. I can set up bill pay. So it creates that convenience for those watching. Yeah, awesome. So you can go ahead and uh, okay. share well, your screen. Okay, well, let's get in here. Let me share my screen, and then we'll get right into the simulator. So I'm going to type in AIOloan.net. Um, we do have two different versions. So there's AIOloan.com, and then there's AIOloan.net. They're basically the same. However, I like to use the net version because this version allows you to save it, and you'll receive a code that you can copy and paste. Um, right down here when you click on get started you'll be able to enter that code in right here and then um, you'll just be able to go right back into where you left off and it'll still save all of your numbers so that's really cool because you know um, you can go in and alter numbers if you want say you know you're going to get um, a large deposit or something and you want to go and see how much more that might benefit you you can go back in and you don't have to put all the same numbers again so that's why i like to use the net version so um, once you get to this screen, you're going to click on get started here. There's also some introductory videos down here that um, you can watch just if you want to learn more about the all in one it. We've probably covered, you know, anything that it says in here, but it's just nice to get, you know, it reiterated in a different way. So the first screen is going to be this loan screen. Um, and there are two different radio buttons here. The first one is comparing the all-in-one to a new loan that you're considering for either a refinance or a new home purchase. And the second one is going to be if you want to compare it to an existing loan that you already have on your home, um, you know, to be able to refinance into the all-in-one. So we'll just start plugging in the numbers and then Denzel, feel free to stop me at any time, you know, if there's any questions that come up or if you have any comments. So yep. we'll put the home value at 500000 And um, this is the comparison loan. So we're going to do the 30-year fixed. Um, the loan balance, you know, we'll do to the 90% mark for this one. So that'll be 450 and then the interest rate, you know, what I'm seeing right now, and just because I want to really give like a good side by side comparison, I'm going to do a pretty low interest rate. So I'll do it at 2.875, which, you know, at least in California, is pretty typical right now for a 30 year fix for a conventional. And then here for the monthly payment, um, it already kind of gives you, you know, an estimate because it's a principal and interest payment only. So you definitely have to make sure that you're paying attention to that, say, you know, if you already do have your payment set for a purchase or even if it's for a refinance, you know, and you know your payment amount, you do not want to include your taxes and insurance. And this part is really the most important part um, on this screen because it's the only area that actually gets inputted into the results. So you definitely want to make sure that you put at least pretty close to what your principal and interest monthly payment is. Um, right here, the loan age, that's only if you do have an existing loan, um, just to show you, you know, the difference of um, years that it's going to take you to pay off. So it doesn't apply to this because this is a new purchase. And down here, I'm making extra payments. Um, you know, if you anticipate making extra payments, you can add that in there. Or if you currently have a home and you do make extra payments, you can add that in too. And then it does. Yeah, you know what? I think what would be really what would be really cool because I know oftentimes velocity banking gets uh, a lot of heat in terms of um, oh why not just make extra payments towards your 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 property and you'll you'll pay it off faster. So in in my case I want to conservatively say that each and every month there will be a a net of 12,000 um, principal, right, or in this case, extra payment that would uh, mm -hmm. would go into that property each and every month. So let's compare all in one 
to a debt snowball strategy on a 30 year fixed amortized mortgage. So making extra payments of, of $12,000, right? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, yeah. you know, let's just see, okay, here's how fast that would be paid off. And then doing the same exact thing. But in our case, we're dumping in 20,000 each and every month into the all in one and, and see right. where we see where we get. Okay. Awesome. Let's do that. So we have the 12,000 extra payments there going, you know, completely towards the principal. Um, this is where you, it's optional. You can add in your second mortgage if you have, you know, a second, if you have a HELOC. So down here, it basically just gives you the totals, 450 um, loan amount, the total monthly payment, and then making extra payments. So when we continue to the next screen, this is the deposit screen. So um, it does give you the option, you know, you can put your deposits, your spouse, co-borrower, significant other. It does also allow you to add more people um, or if you just want to add in, you know, more deposits that you anticipate getting. Um, so in this net deposit right here, I'm going to use that 20,000 figure. And that's a monthly figure. Um, it's usually best to just keep it on the monthly. I mean, obviously, it does have all these different options. So if you do get paid weekly and you really don't know your monthly amount, you can do that or, you know, all of these other options as well. So we have the 20,000 monthly, which the annual total is 240,000. And we'll leave these blank. And I do want to point out that down here where it says future lump sum deposits, this is if, you know, you do have some type of deposit that you know is going to be coming in, like maybe a bonus check that you get from work, right? And you already know the net deposit of the amount that's going to be going into the account. And um, you can choose the month of the loan, of the all-in-one loan, that you anticipate it going into the account. And it'll consider that when it calculates the results. So that's really cool. It also has that on the withdrawal screen, which I'll go over. And those are both really cool features that I like to use a lot. So we'll go to continue and now we're on the withdrawals page. Um, so it does have two options here as well. Um, the first option is to enter a percentage of deposits that are typically left over at the end of each month. And the second is the detailed itemization of all of your expenses, bills and investments. I would very, very rarely recommend the second option. This first option, um, is easier for one, but the difference between itemizing, you know, the major difference is that the expenses section, um, the, the simulator uses data on what homeowners spend weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annual and annual. And so we're taking those money increments out during those different timeframes to simulate an actual homeowner. So it takes into consideration, you know, the fluctuations in spending for the consumer throughout the different months, since some months are higher spending months and some are lower spending months. And it also takes into consideration things like your property taxes and home insurance. And so all of that's already accounted for in here. Um, when we use the itemization, you know, that's not really relying on the data. So the borrower needs to know exactly what they're spending weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annual and annual. So for some people who really do keep track of all of that, this could be an option, um, but more likely than not, the percentage option is, is going to work just fine. So I just wanna make sure that that makes sense before I move forward. Yeah, that's pretty clear to me. Okay, perfect. So here you're going to see um, all of it laid out for you. So we have the deposits, You know, it takes into consideration that mortgage payment right? Because it's already assuming that, you know, now that mortgage payment is going to sit idle in your account, um, since you don't necessarily have to be paying it. Yeah, you know what, let's, it, uh, let's, let's fix that. Because on the, uh, on the debt snowball example, we're showing 12,000 in extra principal payments, separate right. from separate from the mortgage payment. So I want the numbers to show that on on this end, that our, uh, expenses already factor in that mortgage payment so it actually is a pure 12,000 uh, principal on this one instead of it doing the 13 867 
want it to be at. Right. Well, 12. it is it is including it just as principal, basically, because it's a principal and interest payment. So it's calculating, you know, your principal and interest payment, which is that. 1867 and then an additional 12,000 in principal on top of that, which is where it gets that figure. So if you want, we can do it both ways. We can yeah, you just lower the expense number. Yeah, you can do that. So it shows 12. And I think that'll, should fix it. So are you saying that you want to take out this extra payment or you just want to adjust the expense? I think we did it right. I see. Okay, extra payments total twelve. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. we haven't adjusted the percentage amount for the expenses yet, so got we still it. need to do that. Got it. Got it. I think we're good. Yeah. No. It, I thought I got a little confused there, so I think we're good. And we can yes. always go back and adjust things too. So this is just kind of you know the initial. Right. I just want to make sure. So, I just want to make sure the numbers are the same, so it doesn't right uh, confuse anyone. All right. Yeah. Continue. So um, down here for the leftover percentage amount, I typically like to start with 25%. Um, and then, you know, we can adjust it lower or higher to get a more accurate number of what dollar amount you do have left over each month after any expenses are paid. So with the 25%, it shows, you know, 5,000 will be left over after all the expenses are paid plus that anticipated mortgage payment that you would have paid with a traditional loan. So with that $5,000 number right here a month, does that look like too much left over, too little left over? Um, let's All right, we're already we've already factored in the 12,000 cash flow, which is the extra payment. So mm -hmm. What I don't want to do here, because this will, if we show leftover, then it'll be uh, it'll be way ahead of the of the debt snowball, which might be a little inaccurate. So I think if we kept it at zero, because the cash flow is the money left over, so we can just right. show. Okay, I got you. So you, you know what I'm saying, no right? Right, right. T well. In, the, in this example, let's just show no money left over because we already showed that what's left over is the 12,000. That is, that is my cash flow. So 20,000 goes in, 20,000 goes in each and every month. 8,000 comes out of that 8,000 is my mortgage payment, all my bills, things like that. Gotcha. So it's not gonna work at zero. You can see that when I put there, there's oh, okay. red lining all around it, but I can do I could try to do it at 1%. Which yeah, let's just let's just do that. And we'll try that. Typically when you're doing it, it won't really work properly if you got it. Manage so then on the uh, so then let's go back to the the debt snowball comparison and put 11,800. Okay, perfect. And that should be uh, more accurate. And this is good for those that are watching, when you put in your numbers, when you're comparing debt snowball versus velocity banking using all in one, you want to make sure your numbers are in fact showing you the right stuff. You don't want to make that mistake where, where oh, it looks like I'm putting in a 12,000 extra payment plus I have another 5,000 in cash flow that just came out of nowhere. So that's actually not the case uh, for, for me yeah. specifically. Yeah. And you can do it both ways. You know, you can do it the way that we did it, or you can leave the mortgage payment out at what it will be realistically. And then you can, you know, add that leftover amount here, that extra 12,000. Right, right. That's another, I guess, simpler way to show it. Leftover show 12,000. That, that's good too. Yeah, either way, it's going to, you know, take it into consideration. So, okay. So down here, like I mentioned on the deposit screen is where you can put a future lump sum withdrawal. So, you know, if you have something big coming up, um, if you're paying for, you know, your kids to go to college or something, and you know that there's a certain amount that you're going to be withdrawing out of the account, you can add that in here and you can put the anticipated month that it's going to come out and um, it'll calculate with that figure. So it's really cool. So we'll leave that alone. So now we get to the results page. So 
this is where the magic happens. <laughs> this shows you, you know, with all of those residual dollars, how quickly you'll pay it down. So on the left side, we have our product, the all-in-one loan. And um, on the right side, we have the comparison loan. So the reason why, so this is actually a really good example. So we're going to go over this because here it shows the all-in-one would actually not save you interest. It would actually charge you more in interest, which is by, you know, almost $11,000. And um, you would pay it off in almost three years. So the big reason why it's showing this, well, there, there's a few different reasons. But the first reason is because we added that extra payment amount, right? So in doing that, if you have a 30, a traditional, you know, 30 year fixed loan, and you add that amount to principal, it's still really saving you interest, right? Um, but what I want to point out before we really get into the details, is that the interest that's the interest rate that's being used for this example is 6.062, which obviously we know is not the current interest rate. And on the other side, the interest rate is, um, I don't know why it's not showing on here, but it's 2.875. So if we scroll down here, there's this little area that says interest rate environment. And right now the option is on rates increasing to the historical average. So basically what it does is the rate is derived from the highest margin amount plus the index rate and then taking that index and bumping it up to the historical average of, Li of LIBOR for the last 25 years. So for one, the highest margin amount is not where we're going to be starting. So we should really change this to 3.5 margin because that's where it's at. And then it gives you the initial rate of 3.75. So let's first go back to the results and see that. And then we'll come back down here. So now you can see instead of that almost 11,000, it changed to about you know, negative 9,000. The second thing that you want to take into consideration is that for the interest rate environment, there's another option, the stable rates at current level. And the difference is with this one, instead of taking that index and never letting it come back down, which is what the other option does, we're letting LIBOR act similar to how it's actually acted for over the last 25 years. And it's really more of a stable and current environment. So it gives it more of an increase and a decrease that would, we would normally see rather than just take it to the highest that it's ever been over the last 25 years and never allow it to come back down. So this option, the rates increasing, is more of a worst case scenario. It's not likely, um, but the simulator just already assumes that to kind of give you that worst case scenario. So if we change it to the stable rates at current level and then go back to the results, it still is at a negative. So it's at a negative 5,000. Um, so the big difference here, you know, would just be the access to cash. Um, in the end, it does show that you're going to, you know, be losing $5,000 in interest um, dollars. I'm sorry. Yeah, in interest um, rather than using the 30 year fixed having it stay at that 2.875 and, you know, paying that 12,000 extra every month. Um, one other thing that I do want to point out though, is that if you have that $12,000, you know, um, at the end of each month, that's great. And you can put it into that payment, but you're never going to be able to use it. Right. So once you give that $12,000 payment to this 30 year fixed loan, that's it. It's going to be there. You know, you, you can't take it out unless you decide to get a HELOC, obviously. With the all-in-one, you have that flexibility where if you deposit, you know, you're not really depositing it, but if you leave that $12,000 sitting idle in the account, well, whenever you should need it for anything, even small expenses, you're able to take it out. Right? So this is typically not what we see when comparing the results. Um, we did also use, you know, like that very low interest rate, which is good, though, because it really points out all these different facets of it. Yeah. And then I think if I would, uh, I'd, I'd come in like butt in now and I can explain to really everyone what we're dealing with as you see something like that. So when it comes to us deciding do I want to say do the debt snowball concept making extra payments versus velocity banking? 
And there are some cases where it doesn't uh, make sense, but I'm gonna explain why in my scenario, this will uh, make sense. I will come out ahead, right? And I'm gonna kind of come to the drawing board of certain things that we add in the velocity banking space to make up for that, that difference. And one of the main things was what Heather said was the access to cash. In a perfect world, yeah, probably debt snowball would be better. Make your extra 12K payment each and every month, but it is definitely not a perfect world, number one. <laughs> number two, emergencies come up. Yes, they will, right? And the likelihood of an individual the likelihood and discipline of a person putting in $12,000 cash flow, free cash flow each and every month, having that discipline to put into their mortgage is highly, highly uh, uh, unlikely. You will not see that happen often. So I wanna kind of bring that into perspective. There's what the numbers say on the picture, right? In the software, but in reality, like, I don't know that many people that can say, I'm gonna pay 12,000 for over 24 months straight and have that discipline and not say, I wanna put that 12,000 in an investment somewhere else. I wanna put that 12,000 into my cash value policy. I'm gonna put that 12,000 to pay for my kid's college. I'm gonna put that 12,000 over here to cover this death that just occurred because someone just died in the family because of COVID. So you're gonna have all these different things that will come up. Right, I'm sure Heather, you can agree with this, right? So far, absolutely. So, yeah. with the all-in-one, to to make the numbers even better for us in our favor, is we will add credit cards to the equation, both zero percent right. credit cards, and the ones with zero um, percent with the balance transfers. Okay, this is something that I don't think. CMG Financial actually would teach, you know, maybe, you know, uh, someone like a Heather would definitely, I know you, you would definitely want to get into this a little more in mm -hmm. terms of helping the client actually wipe it out a little faster. But when I'm talking mm -hmm. to my clients, this is what we'll do is we'll take a credit card with 0% in actual balance transfer fees. Like there is no 2%, 3%. So we'll find those credit cards that exist where there's no balance transfer fee. And what we'll do is we'll calculate um, what their taxes are for the year, right, on that property, and maybe some other uh, annual expense. So we'll uh -huh. look at we'll look at annual bills, and we'll we'll take those bills. This is money that they're going to spend. So we're not actually going into more debt. We're just taking existing bills that they know they're going to spend. Instead of paying their bills monthly, such as a phone bill, subscriptions, car insurance, right, and even taxes, is we, we bundle that up into one whole uh, switch to an annual payment. And usually annual saves us money when we convert from paying monthly to annual. So that actually increases our cash flow a little bit by right. doing this. Then, because these are say purchases on the credit card, you've got the cash back rewards that'll come. And then there's statement credit for spending 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 or more within the first 90 days. We can easily hit that for an average household based on their annual bills. So between a mixture of purchases on a credit card and balance transfers, like I said, we find those ones with zero fees, no cost whatsoever. And usually it's a 12 month uh, zero interest period, sometimes higher. I've seen 18, 15, I've even seen 21 or 24. They're mm -hmm. insane in terms of the mm -hmm. zero interest time frame. And so by doing that, what does that allow? That allows more of my 20 to stay in the all in one loan month to month, right? The other thing that we didn't show in the calculation is. She, Heather put one time net of 20K. When in reality, when, when we show the uh, expenses coming out, like it might be fine to show the net 20 going in, but the expenses coming out, I'm not sure if we, sh um, we didn't itemize um, because that's how you will 
decrease that number from 2.9, you'll, you'll get it lower to like 2.25. Um, just by itemizing every single bill on each and every date that it comes out because that's less interest being calculated. So that's another thing in our favor. Mm -hmm. And then more importantly, there's the whole notion of just getting out of debt, right? Everybody wants to get out of debt for the most part, out of bad debt. So the, the, the situation is either I do debt snowball or I do this velocity banking, mortgage acceleration. But here's what velocity banking all in one loan gives us versus say debt snowball is we have the freedom to have access to our cash so that if we come to a determination that paying off debt is not as lucrative that, oh, maybe there's an investment opportunity I can get into of venture capital, right? I can be right. an angel investor. There's some opportunity that could exist that could save me a ton of money or make me a ton of money, either or. And, and I have the cash flow to do so. So not only am I getting out of debt, but I'm also, say, 10xing my income. And this is something that I like to demonstrate someone like myself that is going to most likely do the all in one loan if I get approved by the end of this year or sometime summer of 2021 is not only am I parking, right? I'm doing paycheck parking into the all in one, but I'm also that 12K cash flow that might get used for something. For example, mm -hmm. There was a question that came in from uh, Jason Stebbins who was asking about, he was saying, you know, would it be better off, would I be better off using infinite banking with a life insurance policy as cash flow of approximately 5K a month instead of um, the all-in-one loan? Instead of getting the all-in-one, shouldn't he just get, say, a traditional mortgage and get a cash value life insurance policy? And, and pay off his property that way. Well, I think he would have more flexibility with the all-in-one, and here's would be my example is, my income goes into my all-in-one. So it automatically decreases the principal owed, drops the interest rate. Then I pull from the all-in-one to establish my tax-free bank, my cash value life insurance policy, which is gonna earn a, a steady guaranteed tax-free compounding interest rate of somewhere around four to 6% flat. Could be a little bit less, might be a little bit more in, in the future, but it's money that starts to compound, right? And then I borrow out of the insurance policy back into the all-in-one and then I invest, right? Or it comes out of the cash value to a, uh, let's say a checking account and it invests. But in most cases, it might just sit in here until the investment appears, the opportunity appears, right? right. So, so these are a lot of, we have so many different options. We're not locked in to a 30 year fixed mortgage that 12,000 like you said, I never get access to that again unless I do what? Get a home equity line of credit in the first or second position, do a cash out refinance. You know, all that costs money, time, and credit to actually accomplish those things. So it gives us that flexibility, that freedom. We have more freedom to get out of debt while also investing, trying to 10x our income, trying to build wealth simultaneously we're using a dollar more than once right so even if that snowball gets us debt free in 2.9 years and then with all my little added on little tricks here and finesse moves maybe i'm able to do it in like 2.25 or 2.5 still not a drastic difference right still not a drastic difference but after i'm debt free what can this person do immediately exactly immediately go and invest. Exactly. This person 
it's going to take them time, money, credit to go use their, their equity to pull it out to then go invest. This person's already ahead of them. Two, three steps. Any, you know, any, any thoughts also on that? A couple of things I want to point out with the 30 year fix, you know, it is very likely that you could get a 2.875% rate, but it is also very likely that you might have to pay for that rate too. It probably won't be $5,000, but it could very well be, you know, two, $3,000 to buy that rate down to that mark. So you're kind of seeing that cost there too. And also, you know, like you mentioned, Denzel, um, if you want to start using that money after it's paid off to invest or other, you know, in other areas, then yeah, you will definitely have to do a cash out refi or, you know, maybe um, a HELOC. But if you do do a cash out refi, there's definitely going to be cost to that too. So you're going to kind of going to see those costs as well. And just in general about the simulator, um, even though the all in one recalculates the interest daily, the simulator actually at this point is not designed that way. So it still does show results based on how like a traditional HELOC would calculate interest, which is, you know, typically monthly. So the results that you see there are not always going to be the most to what the most accurate of what's actually benefiting you. I usually don't have to bring that up to people because even with that, it's it's usually very eye opening, you know, the difference in the results. But that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Yeah. And I think another thing to point out is most people are not cash flowing 12,000 a month. In reality, um, I just read an article that uh, over 40% of Americans don't even have $400 in their savings account. Uh, and I know for a fact that over 60% of Americans live paycheck to the paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. right. don't, don't have more than a thousand, you know, so 40% don't have 400. I know the number is over 60% in terms of Americans that don't have a thousand in savings. Right. So, you know, once you start getting into the income levels of multiple six figures, seven figure earners, and even eight figures, they have a drastically different mindset on how they view debt. They no longer see debt as a bad thing. It's debt that makes them money. It's debt that's liquid. So for, mm -hmm. for a lot of, uh, say, real estate investors, people that have a lot of cash flow, people like myself that make a lot of money, have a lot of cash flow, having an all in one loan for the next 10 years is a great place for me to just access as much cash as I need whenever I need it without having to go through approvals. I don't have to worry about this thing locking up on me, right? Versus a, 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 a home equity line of credit. So I, I get that freedom and um, I get that mobility. Um, there was a question that came in regarding um, using all in one loans to invest in multifamily real estate, I think the limit is four units, correct? In terms of correct. the in terms of the purchase. You know, if I have a million dollar all in one loan on a on a single family property and there's seven hundred K of of equity access, right? And I take five hundred and I go buy a six unit building or a seven hundred thousand and I buy a twelve unit building with you know, 10% down, whatever the case with a traditional mortgage, that's a different story. So right. there is like a little around, we can go a little bit around that, but in terms of actually purchasing a property with a all in one loan, you can only go up to four units, right? Right. Because one to four yeah. units is considered residential. And right. Above that is commercial. commercial. Right. Yeah, so but you can absolutely use the funds to purchase a commercial property. Yeah. You just won't be able to obtain an all in one loan on that right. property. Right. And at that point, here's the other thing, different mindset. The person that accumulates a commercial property, 8, 12, 16, 48, 500 unit, they're not necessarily trying to pay that off anytime soon. They're trying right. to they're trying to cash flow from that, minimize costs, do a cash out refinance once all the rents come in to pay down that mortgage essentially. And then they refinance it into a smaller rate, a lower rate, they get cash out and they get the next multifamily unit. So the more, the more doors, the more cash flow, the more power they have, the more influence it becomes, how do I get more debt instead of 
pay off debt. Yeah. So it's a, uh -huh. it's a drastic shift. So for those that are making 100K and under, your mindset is typically around, let me get out of this bad debt, right? And this might work for some cases, it's just a thought. For a husband and wife, three kids, they're each bringing maybe 100, 150K a year. They got two car loans, they got the student loans, they've got the credit cards, they've got the personal loans. Maybe if they got an all-in-one, they can start consolidating all their debts mm -hmm. into that, into that all-in-one. It might work. Usually the way that I teach it is I try to get them out of that other stuff first, then we, we kill it with the all-in-one. Usually that might make more sense, but in some cases, you know, if there's, if they have capital, right? If someone has capital, instead of throwing it at all that consumer debt, maybe we can put it into their main property, which is, which could become an asset. Mm -hmm. It becomes an all-in-one, right? They've refinanced it into an all-in-one. They get that mm -hmm. access to the equity and they start rerouting that 9% loan to three and a 3.75 or four rerouting that car loan from 7% to four, and you start creating that, that instant cash flow. You cannot do that with regular loans. You cannot do that in the debt snowball world. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of, lot of you know, cool advantages there. Yeah, and you know, just to touch on that too, you know, these results are showing that, that you know, that 12,000 amount will be paid extra to principal every month. And, you know, who's to say that it actually will. So it's not saying, you know, yeah, most months I probably will if I have it left over, if I don't need to use it for anything else. The simulator is assuming that every single month that extra 12000 is just only going to go towards the payment. And that's it. You know, and that's not really ideal for most people either. No, you're absolutely right. What about what about saving money? What about investing? What about different opportunities? What about emergencies? All that stuff. Uh, people have to account for that if you don't have an all-in-one loan account or some or some type of debt tool. The all-in-one is a replacement for my savings. Instead of having that money sit in the bank earning less than 0.01%, I can have my savings sit in my all-in-one loan, mm -hmm. save 3%, which is actually making me money mm -hmm. because then I get access to that equity to then go put it into work go put it to play and, and go make some money with it. Start a business, yeah. sell a product or a service, market something, a uh, lot of freedom there. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else that you uh, wanted to share? If not, um, I'm gonna kind of look at some Q&A here and see what we got. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, a good amount more on the actual results screen. Um, to you want me to, over. yeah, let me- uh, If you want to touch on that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We're back here on the results screen. So again, I mean, even though it shows that negative figure, I don't think that these results are bad when you take everything else into consideration. So just to kind of go down the line and just explain what all these different areas are so that when any of you are using the simulator, you already know everything that you're reading. So in this payment section, <clears throat> the average minimum monthly payment this is an interest payment only, that's 722. And this is the average payment that you would be paying over that 2.8 years. So obviously, you know, in the beginning of the loan, it might be more. And then eventually it will go down to this number, which is the average amount. And then it'll continue to decrease more and more and more until, you know, it gets to $10 and then it's at zero, right? So um, this average monthly principal reduction this is how much on average your monthly principal amount is going to be reduced by. So on average, every month, that 13,000 figure, that principal amount is going to be reduced by that much. And that's basically just, you know, that payment that you're um, planning on keeping idle in the account. Down here on the cost summary section, it shows the principal paid. It's the same for both um, loans and the principal reduction rate, which is just the rate of this number right here. So it's pretty similar, you can see that. The total interest paid here shows about 24,000 and here it shows about 19,000, which you know is reflected in at the top of it here, that interest saved amount. 
interest as percent of principal. So this is really the part that I like to focus on right here. If you see these two lines right here, the interest as percent of principal and the interest rate used, for example, um, I like to break this number down to the tens of dollars. And that's what really is kind of eye opening to how much um, money is actually going to principal um, every month. So if you break this down to the tens of dollars, that would be five cents, really. That's um, going to principal. I'm sorry, not every month. Sorry, I did that incorrectly. Okay, so every $10 borrowed in the all-in-one, that would be five cents going towards interest. Whereas, you know, the comparison loan, typically you don't see this number again. These results are a little bit different than what you typically see. But every for every $10 that's borrowed with the comparison loan, only four cents would be going to interest. So this comparison isn't a really good comparison when looking at this percentage. But if you just really hone in on the all-in-one, five cents is what would be going towards interest for every $10. And the remaining amount would be going to principal. So that's pretty eye-opening right there. And then the effective rate, that 5.672, that's just what you know the all-in-one has to be at to even be effective. This break-even rate, the 2.910, this is what the all-in-one would have to be at to be um, exactly like this comparison loan. So typically, you would see a much higher number here um, when you, know, you use more typical numbers that you plug in. Usually you see, you know, like 10 point something or even like 18 point something. And that's really big because when you know that that's the break even rate to be um, to give you the exact same savings as a comparison loan, you know, that's also really eye opening. And then down here, the graphs and payment details. This one's pretty self-explanatory. You know, this is the credit limit. Obviously, after the 10 years, it starts to decrease. It shows there. This is the all in one loan. And then on this side, the cumulative interest cost. This graph shows the interest that the borrower is going to have to pay on the loan. So you're seeing that the two loans are somewhat similar. They're right next to each other. And in this case, you know, the comparison loan also tapers off as the all-in-one does as well. Typically what you would see is the all-in-one kind of tapering off like this and the comparison loan continuing to go up. Got and it. Just, down just to... Uh clarify on the left chart where the credit limit decreases over time does it does it eventually go to zero after it does eventually go to zero at the end of the 30 years you can see right here it says 20 so this would be the 30 year mark because right. you need to pay it off within that 30 years and then it's boom it's it's shut closed out correct so, Got right. it. so after the 30 years yeah you would no longer have that draw period so when we go down here to the interest rates and assumptions, so this is kind of where we already touched on, you know, you can change some different features of it. This is where you can change it to a three-year fix option and a five-year fix option. I actually did that already just because I wanted to see if it made any difference in the results, um, which it doesn't because, again, we're using that stable rates at current level. So it's pretty similar to that anyways, um, but you can change you know, to that, if you if you have a loan payoff, that might be more than three or five years um, and it might change those results for you. And this is where you would select the margin automatically. It does that three point seven five margin. Um, I usually put the three point five because that's what the margin is at right now. And this just shows you the details, right? So the current one month LIBOR index is at point one four three percent. Um, which creates the fully indexed rate at 3.643, which is this added to the margin. Resulting lifetime cap, we went over that, the 9.643, that's adding this to that 6% cap. And then the floor rate is at 3.75. Um, we went over this, which gives you that rate. And um, here it shows you the 25-year historical average value, which is 2.447%, which actually really good and then you know you can take a look at this if you want and it will show you the historical graph so i think that's pretty much it on the details of the simulator um so i hope you guys all found it helpful you know really each and every one of you should be doing a side-by-side -side comparison like this for your own situation and 
Of course, I'm here to help with that after today's event as well.